members for uh, starting such a fantastic event uh, during this difficult time. So we're all at home and some people are working on shift basis. I think with this, um, you know, I would like to present today about management of PPHN in NICU level two. Um, so I would start basically my flow of presentation will be a brief introduction, fetal circulation, pathophysiology involved, and etiology, basically touching what are the reversible causes of PPHN, how to diagnose PPHN, what are the current therapeutic evidence-based management, and I'll conclude. Lights are not moving over here in the computer. One of one, you are a person of Hako. Haki, the Haku and the Talbot tail in ninety nine point two. You and Kalasama, sir, and everybody can talk for Kalu. Our bone is a tailor to cut a ringly cut market. Okay, I will continue. So we know all know that the neonatal PPHN is a quite a common condition in an ICU. So it contributes around 18 per thousand live births. This is a overseas data causing hypoxic respiratory failure. Out of that 10% of the neonates with respiratory failure have pulmonary hypertension. The incidence is as close as two per thousand live births. And the mortality is around eight to 15%. And nearly it was around 50% in early 80s. What we don't know is the impact of this pulmonary hypertension during the early childhood and late, you know, childhood and even in adults. So there's a lot of uh, research going on and probably we'll get the data as, as the year passes on. I would like to present uh, my presentation just with a brief uh, you know, introduction of what happens uh, at the gas exchange at the gas interface, you know, alveolar gas interface barrier. So this is electronic microscopic uh, appearance of uh, the alveoli as well as the pulmonary capillary within the alveoli. So you can see that it is such a thin barrier. It measures only 0.3 micrometers. And what you can see there is a pulmonary capillary with a you know, red blood cell, it is dumbbell shaped. And the alveolar epithelium on the other side and the capillary endothelium inside. And in between the interstitium and also the surfactant layer over there. So the diffusion of gas happens at this level. This is where the oxygenation happens at the pulmonary capillaries. So it's such an important slide to understand, you know, what happens in pulmonary hypertension is purely hypoxemic changes due to severe pulmonary vasoconstriction and probably also an element of atelectasis where there's no diffusion of gas. This is another slide which represents, you know, how the capillaries look um, in a microscopic section. You can see a well aerated lung there. And you can also see pulmonary capillary and you can see the red blood cells, you know, flowing through that. And this is a slide where you can just imagine you're sitting inside the alveoli and you see externally how it looks. So basically you can see the pulmonary capillaries there, the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary veins. So this is a complex structure. This is in one alveoli. So you can just imagine there are multiple alveoli and the surface area involved is gas exchange. Now, just coming to the definition of PPHN, so it's a failure to achieve the normal decrease in PVR at birth, leading to a very labile systemic arterial hypoxemia. 
and this is due to altered pulmonary vascular tone reactivity or structure as a result there is resulting right to left shunting across the ductus arteriosus as well as the foramen ovale now a brief introduction of the fetal circulation because it's quite important to understand what happens during the fetal life and as the baby is born what is the transition that happens so what you can see there is the oxygenation of the blood which is passing through the ductus venosus from the placenta the concentration of oxygen is around 45 to 50 millimeters of hg and the sp spo2 is around 50 to 60 percent so the blood travels through the ductus venosus to the right atrium to the paraffin oil to the left atrium and left ventricle and then to the ascending iota so mainly a concentrated part of the oxygen is delivered to the brain and to the myocardium the other parallel circulation where the blood from the lower part of the body is going to the ivc right atrium right ventricle through the ductus it gets into the descending iota so if you look at only 16 percent of the total cardiac output is drained to the lungs in the fetal life. so this is a parallel circulation in the fetus now what happens when the baby is born after birth so there is a tremendous expansion of lung as the baby starts breathing there's a rapid drop drop in the pulmonary vascular resistance then increased pulmonary blood flow to the time of 10 then spontaneous closure of PDA, which occurs soon after birth and continues to close or become narrow over time during the first few hours and then later part of the days. And the ventricle starts functioning, increasing the cardiac output. Now it becomes more of a free circulation rather than a parallel circulation. And consequently, there is an increase in systemic vascular resistance. This slide depicts what are the changes which happens in utero as well as when the baby is born. So there is change in pulmonary vascular resistance and the systemic vascular resistance at various gestation. And when, if you see here, the first left half of your slide shows at various canicular, saccular, and alveolar stage, the pulmonary vascular resistance is quite high. And that is mainly due to the low density of the vasculature, increasing vascular density, and due to a decreased oxygenation in the fetus, there's active vasoconstriction. So as soon as the baby is born, you could see that there is a drop in the pulmonary vascular resistance, and consequently, there is an increase in systemic vascular resistance. And this is what happens as soon as the baby is born. What you can notice is babies who are born um, by vaginal delivery, they drop their pulmonary pressure quite significantly compared to babies who are born by caesarean section or they have any underlying lung disease or if they're born preterm. So these are the two points where you can see a drop in the pulmonary vascular resistance and increase in system vascular resistance. Now, when you look at a baby uh, and you measure the pulmonary parameters in the fetus near term, compared with the three-day old neonate, you could see there is a change in the pulmonary, you know, arterial wall thickness, and it is kind of represented as 3% compared to 6% in the fetus. The pulmonary arterial pressure drops to 20 from 55. The pulmonary blood flow, which was around 138, increases by two folds to 245, and the pulmonary vascular resistance also falls significantly. So as soon as the baby is born, there is rhythmic respiration. So when the baby starts to breathe, then there is also an oxygen tension buildup in the alveoli. And both these two factors decrease the PDR and there is increased flow of you know, blood to the pulmonary vascular resistance and the vascular resistance fall. And there is going to be vas vasodilatation in the pulmonary bed. Now, when you come to the pathophysiology, the changes happen predominantly in the pulmonary vasculature. The changes can be in the lung. And also, they definitely, these two contributing factors can cause some changes in the cardiac cycle too. What happens in the pulmonary vascular bed is more of the smooth muscle thickness. We all know that as the muscle, smooth muscle thickness increases, there's going to be increased PVR. So, 
in this at the same time if there is a decrease in the pulmonary uh, you know in the smooth muscle thickness there's going to be decrease in the pulmonary mm -hmm. vascular resistance any failure to achieve this is going to pph the muscularization of this smooth muscle can extend to even periphery causing even more harm to the baby leading to kind of retractable pph now what happens what are the things which can change in the lung is what uh, you know determines the outcome of most of our babies when we manage pH. so these are called as secondary changes in the lungs it can be because of meconium aspiration syndrome it can be because of pneumonia or sepsis it can be because of respiratory distress syndrome it can be because of transient pregnancy of newborn due to retaining of lung fluid or it can be because of a complex condition called as congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Let's say you see a lung and there is an element of PPHN, but the lung looks fine. Then this condition is primarily because of primary PPHN, or we call it as idiopathic. We don't know the cause of pulmonary hypertension. When you look at the X-ray, the X-ray looks black, and now the new terminology is like, like called as black lung PPHN. Now, what happens in the heart? during PPHN due to high vascular resistance is a shunting of blood either extrapulmonary or intracardiac. So extrapulmonary is made a shunt across the ductus arteriosus where there's going to be a differential cyanosis. The right hand and the lower part of the body have a difference of saturations. But when there is mixing of blood at the foramen ovale, the baby tend to have the same saturations. Not only it causes a differential saturations due to increased pulmonary vascular resistance, there is increase in you know, pulmonary arterial pressure, which causes pulmonary insufficiency, leading to the right heart you know, failure. So by you know the baby as such will have right ventricular hypertrophy, and that can lead to tri uh, tricuspid regurgitation, and the intraventricular septum bulges to the left and causes left ventricular dysfunction. So you start with the right ventricular dysfunction and then you went into, go into a left ventricular dysfunction and this is what happens in biventricular dysfunction in these babies. So not only that, they can land up with decreased um, systemic blood pressure as well as systemic vascular resistance drop. And this is particularly seen in babies um, who are prone with uh, with a history of sepsis or if they are in septic shock and that is one of the cause for pulmonary hypertension. Now, based on the etiology, we can classify pulmonary hypertension mainly into four types. One is because of maladaption, as we, as I mentioned earlier, because of uh, meconium aspiration or respiratory distress syndrome or pneumonia, where there is poor adaptation because of a secondary injury to the lung. Or there is a problem with maldevelopment where the pulmonary vascular bed is remodeled. And these are the babies who are highly difficult to manage initially and they might require longer time to come out of uh, mechanical ventilation or all the medications what we use to treat for PPHN. This is what is classically called as idiopathic or black lung PPHN. Or the lungs are maldeveloped or underdeveloped. This secondary to congenital diaphragmatic hernia, or when babies have, when the fetus have severe oligodromia, secondary to renal disease, or there's prolonged rupture of membrane. So these babies, when they're born, they have very less surface area of lung and the pulmonary vasculature is not developed or underdeveloped. There's another entity called as obstruction. There's sludging of uh, pulmonary vascular blood um, and they can cause obstruction due to polycythemia and hyperviscosity symptoms. So based on the ETLG, we can classify uh, according to what type of pulmonary hypertension it is. Now coming to the etiology of pulmonary hypertension, what we are today focusing on mainly on acute causes which are reversible and, and which are reversible based on the pulmonary cause or non-pulmonary cause like hypoxia, uh, like birth asphyxia can lead to pulmonary hypertension or some late causes like infection where pulmonary hypertension can be one of the cause where we treat that. Now, when you look at the causes, 42% of pulmonary hypertension is because of meconium aspiration syndrome. 17% of them is because of respiratory distress syndrome. 
and the primary PPHN contributes around 27%. Infection can be, you know, one of the cause as pneumonia and sepsis, which contributes to 17%. And around 1% to 2% is where there is problem with the lung development or we call it as lung hyperplasia. These numbers are uh, kind of taken from the Western literature. I think there is going to be definitely change in terms of mechanism aspiration and infection as the primary cause with along with RDS in our country. When you put all these etiologies and the type of um, primary hypertension, either PPHN due to secondary causes or a chronic propensity, and the evidence what we have in terms of treatment, what is most important in this slide is to see what are the outcomes in a child with pulmonary hypertension. What surprises is around 25% of these babies can have long-term neurodevelopmental impairment. In comparison with babies who are born with chronic progressive, you know, uh, uh, babies who have uh, been diagnosed to have chronic pulmonary hypertension, the mortality as, is as high as 40 to 60%, but the long-term is poorly documented or you know, is being recorded. So there's a lot of data we need to look into it, what happens to these babies, but there is significant long-term neurodevelopmental impairment in these babies who survive. Now, how do we diagnose pulmonary hypertension? Uh, basically, it is more of clinical diagnosis as well as supportive diagnosis. Whenever you see a child who have disproportionate degree of hypoxemia compared to the lung disease, and there is severe desaturations, probably you think of two causes. One is either it is PPHN or it is something related to congenital heart disease. If you're good at auscultating and if you could appreciate a loud P2, that indicates there's severe pulmonary hypertension. On the pet side, you probably can see, you know, um, yeah. the pre and post saturations. And if the saturations are more than, a uh, difference is more than 20%, the right radial artery saturation, as well as one of the limbs in the lower limb, then probably it indicates there's significant ductal shunting, and that is what is contributing to differential sinuses. But keep in mind that if there is no lack of differential sinuses, that doesn't exclude PPHN. So you still probably have to diagnose by doing an echocardiogram. A lot of people used to do this hyperoxic test nowadays because of um, easy availability of bedside echocardiography and most of the neonatologists are now trying to look for the polymer hypertension. So this you, we generally don't do, but in centers where there is no echocardiography, you can do this blood test, um, do an arterial gas, uh, preferably the right radial artery and see what is the PAO2? If the PAO2s are more than 150, most of the time you probably can exclude the congenital heart disease. But it doesn't mean that there are some of the congenital heart disease where the PAO2s may be still less than 150, and uh, we need to have echocardiography to clearly say that 100% this child doesn't have congenital heart disease. So the gold standard remains to the echocardiography. What I would like to bring at this point is when you do an echocardiography, you probably are measuring the pulmonary pressure, the pulmonary flow. So you can always try to see what is the pulmonary pressure. And imagine if the pulmonary pressures are too high and there is increased pulmonary flow, then you probably have to think of increased flow to the pulmonary circulation, like which happens in VSD and PD. Let's say if there is increased pulmonary pressure and at the same time you have increased <laughs> pressure, PAP, which is often mitral stenosis. So these are two things you probably have to uh, you know, um, try to think of as a uh, guys, sorry, there is somebody whose uh, song is coming up. Can you please mute all the rest of the videos? Sorry about that. Um, so tomorrow there's going to be a talk by Dr. Venkatesh and Sidhu. They are going to talk about echocardiography and I'm sure they'll put on a lot of, um, you know, the clinical aspects as well as how to kind of evaluate pulmonary hypertension in babies. So you can also measure the pulmonary systolic pressure 
And what we see in most of the babies when we do an echo is either the pulmonary pressure is, you know, ISO or supersystem. Now on the bedside, you probably can um, look at what is the oxygenation index. It's a very useful tool. It will assess, you know, what is the severity of pulmonary hypertension. And it is a simple formula which can be applied on the bedside. It is basically calculated by the mean airway pressure times the FiO2 times 100 divided by the arterial PaO2. So based on the oxygenation index, it's been classified as mild less than 15 or equal to 15, moderate more than 15 to 25, severe more than 25 to 40, and quite critical or quite severe between 40. Okay. Another parameter which you can look at the bedside, which is oxygenation saturation index. It's the same as oxygenation index. Here you divide by the preductal SpO2 instead of PaO2. So this value corresponds nearly to the half of what the OI index is. For example, if the OI index is 20, then oxygenation saturation you know, index is around 10. But there's not of enough uh, data or large studies um, which has used this as one of the bedside tools to assess the severity. I'm sure over time, um, we probably would come up with more data on that. There's another parameter we can measure is the uh, an alveolar oxygenation gradient. Again, it is a formula which has been um, you know, over there. We can kind of calculate this. Basically, it is around 10 to 15 as the alveolar oxygen gradient increase, that means there's not much of now alveolar ventilation happening. So that probably tells us there is severe pulmonary hypertension or there is some pulmonary pathology which has been involved. Now, how do we assess a unit pulmonary hypertension? So it's a basic logarithm where you look at the AFA, you look at the alveolar recruitment, whether they are recruited well or not see the underlying pathology and assess the pulmonary blood flow, assess the level of, and also assess the cardiac evaluation, whether the filling is good, actually, so you pull out structural abnormality. Now, what are the therapies we have in pulmonary hypertension? So, there are various therapies which have been tried. One of the common therapies which I have mentioned over here is this. So, you start with um, delivery room resuscitation, they give adequate feed to expand the lungs. Then you start these babies on CPAP if they have respiratory distress. If you know that they have surfactant deficiency, you probably administer surfactant to recruit the lungs. And you use conventional ventilation. And if you are not able to ventilate uh, and achieve what you're supposed to achieve, you probably may have to think of moving this baby on high frequency ventilation. Now, what are the medications we have to selectively vasodilate if you have diagnosed pulmonary hypertension? So basically, you send vasodilate and another one of the gas which we use is nitric oxide. Now, what are the other support in terms of heart we can use? We can use pressors uh, like inotropes and we use mildenone. When we use all this intervention and the child is still sick, that indicates this child is quite severe sick. So these are the ones with the oxygen index of more than 40 would land up on ECMO. Now coming to the oxygen therapy, a lot of studies have gone over the last 10 to 20 years. We all knew that oxygen was an important determinant of uh, pulmonary vascular resistance to fall as the oxygenation increase the pulmonary vascular resistance is to fall. Then supplemental oxygen was the mainstay of therapy for a lot of patients with hypoxic respiratory failure and PPH. But we also know that hypoxia is one of the main factors which can cause pulmonary vascular constriction. Now the question is, what is the optimal PAO2 or what is the optimal saturation? To answer this question, I would like to present a few case reports, I mean few, uh, data which shows that this is one of the articles um, which has clearly shown that um, the mean arterial pressure drops significantly as the PaO2 increases somewhere around 40 to 50. This is again an animal module and um, you know it shows that as soon as the PaO2 reaches around 40 to 50 the pulmonary vascular 
pressure drops. Again, further to substantiate what the few other papers said, they looked at 10%, 21%, and 50% oxygen and saw what the pulmonary vascular resistance happened when the arterial PO2 increased. And you could see that significant number of pulmonary pressure was um, decreased as the PAO2s were around 50 to 100. But if you see some of this, even if the PAO2s are like 100, 150, there was not much of any difference. So it again indicates that if the PAO2s are somewhere around 50 to 60, that's as well as good, that probably have achieved what you would like to achieve. Now looking at what happens when you give nitric oxide from the baseline value of pulmonary vascular resistance, when this subjects have been exposed to 100% oxygen in response to nitric oxide. What you can see is there's a definitive drop in the pulmonary vascular resistance when you start nitric oxide at 20 parts per million from the baseline value. But as soon as the nitric oxide is stopped, within 10 minutes, there is rebound hypertension, pulmonary hypertension. And what you can see is the individuals who were given 100% oxygen had a very significant rebound of pulmonary hypertension compared to individuals with 21%. So again, it shows that you know oxygenation may be good, but the rebound effect is quite drastic. Now, what about the SpO2? What are the saturation which we can aim for? Again, the pulmonary vascular resistance falls significantly when the saturations are around 90 to 95, 96. So initially, when the saturations are high, a low as low as 80, 90, the pulmonary pressures are quite high. And any marginal increase in the saturation is not going to drop further the pulmonary pressure. In fact, they can see a moderate rise in pulmonary vascular resistance. Why is this too? Is because a lot of studies, we all know that now oxygen is no more considered as a safe gas because it induces free oxygen radical you know, and causes reactive oxygen species. They are all potent pulmonary vasoconstriction. So they are like isoprostan, peroxynitrates, and hydrogen peroxide. So they cause the pulmonary vascular bed quite, um, you know, make the vascular constriction and increases the further the pulmonary hypertension. Now, when you measure this oxygen free radical in a term baby, or which has been uh, resuscitated with 100% versus 21%, you can see it takes a couple of days, even months, for the free radicals to come down. So this is the paper which has been published in Journal of uh, Perinatology. We looked at what is the severity of this injury when you use 100% oxygen. Now, as I told you earlier, oxygen was a fantastic gas for a lot of uh, children and adults. Of course, we need to use with caution. So, with this, what can we learn from oxygen? So, you start resuscitating a term baby with 21% FiO2. Avoid both hyperoxia and hypoxemia. There's no further improvement in PVR, even if there is a increase in PO2 more than 60. So try to keep, um, try to achieve a PO2 somewhere around 60 to 70 or 80. That should be good enough. Try to wean the FiO2 before weaning the nitric oxide and try to keep the saturations on this baby between 92 to 97, pre -dubbed. Now coming to the respiration, um, mechanical ventilation, um, most of the babies are, uh, you know, require either a CPAP non-invasive or a full mechanical ventilation. On those babies, if you look at this slide, you can see at extreme ends of ventilation, either you underventilate or overventilate, the pulmonary vascular resistance is quite high. Which is the best spot or which is the best place to ventilate these babies is where the FRC is met. So at eye extreme, either you, either you ventilate, uh, hyperventilate or you underventilate, there's always a chance of, um, you know, these babies having severe pulmonary vascular resistance by stretching these allular vessels or the capillary blood vessels, which has been depicted on the slide. So you need to find a sweet spot to ventilate. Most of the time, clinically, you know, it's very difficult to find, but I think with proper uh, clinical judgment with the blood gas and staying next to the baby, and try to achieve what you want to achieve clinically 
as well as on the plug parameters probably you know that where you are ventilating and then as the baby improves probably can come down on all the ventilation settings as the pulmonary vascular resistance form now so what do we have in terms of mode of ventilation we have non invasive ventilation uh, for milder cases and we can use CPAP, low flow, high flow, whichever the unit uh, protocols or policies you have. And some units do have non-invasive ventilation, they try that. So whatever you use, um, try to assess these babies quite regularly so that you don't land up from mild to moderate and see the PPH. So it's a continuous process of assessment. So keep on checking these babies as they, as they progress. If they improve, great, you know that you are doing. If not, then you need to take a decision whether you need to ventilate them. If you ventilate them, most of the centers we use significance volume guarantee so that you have a homogeneous, uh, you know, expansion of the lung or the alveolar area. What commonly people do ask is whether we ventilate on a conventional ventilation, whether we can use nitric oxide. Yes, of course we can use, but you need to make sure that the ventilation happens well, all the alveoli is open you recruited the lung then only the nitric oxide works if it is under recruited or over recruited probably nitric oxide doesn't work so when you hit up a uh, wall against and then this uh, you know if the ventilatory pressures are quite high you're not able to achieve then the next option is using high frequency or a jet ventilator or oscillator whichever you have in your unit along with that we use nitric oxide and this is what is the best uh, modality for treating a very severe PPHM, where high frequency helps to keep the lungs open up and um, you try to use the gas, then there's a diffusion of this nitric oxide gas and there's going to be decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance. Now, when you ventilate, what do we, you know, do we use surfactant? When should we use? Probably this slide will answer. Now, this is a paper by Kondori, uh, which has been published in 2004 and 13. What they look at is um, a different, uh, you know, primary diagnosis, like mechanism aspiration, PPH, and sepsis. When you give surfactant, you saw that there's a decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance, the PPH and drop. When the same data, when they looked at it, when the surfactant was used earlier, like less than if the oxygenation index is between 15 to 25, they saw a significant drop in the incidence or they came out with pulmonary hypertension quite significantly earlier compared to when you use surfactant with a higher oxygenation index. So what basically it means is if you're using surfactant, use very early, not you know after 48, 72 hours. What they found was a threefold reduction in the risk of ECMO and death. That's quite significant. I think a lot of centers do use surfactant, especially when you know that the lungs are stiff or, or any etiology, either RDS, which we commonly use, or if even in meconium aspiration syndrome, uh, we do use surfactant because meconium do deactivate surfactant. So if you administer surfactant, it would probably recruit the, the few of the alveoli which are open up. Now, what are the other therapeutic options which are available to manage PPH? So we have a few drugs which have been commonly used. One of a few of these drugs are sildenafil, bosenton, milrinon, uh, glucocorticoids, and prostaglandins. So this drug basically act on the pulmonary vasculature, and they act at cyclic GMP level, cyclic AMP, and endothelial pathway either by mediating them or their derivatives or they inhibit. So the next slide shows at different levels where they act. So what do we have? We have prostacycline, prostaglandin, and milrinon, which basically milrinon is one which acts at PDE level, that is cyclic AMP level. We have sildenafil, which acts at PDE5 level, that is phosphorus, diastase, high enzyme inhibitors. And we have CT receptors, endothelial receptors like Bosentan, and we have rokinase inhibitors. Out of this, only few drugs have been used in pharma hypertension. And what the next slide shows is the evidence-based medicine. So the things which have been marked in blue 
have large scale RCT trials and meta analysis. What are those? They are oxygen and indian nitric oxide. There's no doubt about that. And we discussed uh, about oxygen. Um, nitric oxide, um, I'm going to discuss uh, probably with the next episode. Um, I was told to discuss only level two. So, and I think most of the level two don't have nitric oxide or high frequency, so that I've kept it for the next uh, you know, presentation. What do we have the small RCTs are the sildenafil and bosenton. One of these few case reports of case series with use of milrinone, prostacycline, and prostaglandin. So when you look at sildenafil, we know that it is PDE5 inhibitor. It selectively reduces both PVR in animal module and adult humans. And it has been reported to be very successful in the treatment of infants with pulmonary hypertension due to various other causes. There is three studies which looked at it. Um, they did a systemic review and meta-analysis in 77 patients when they had used the enteral sildenafil. What they showed is a reduction in mortality and improved oxygen level. And all these three studies were done where there was no nitric oxide and high frequency. The same thing, um, Steve Horn looked at use of sildenafil intravenous, and what he did was an open label uh, dose escalation um, study, which looked at IV infusion of sildenafil for babies between 48 to 7 days of age with severe PPH and with the oxygenation index more than 50. So, in these babies, um, when they started, there was a significant uh, OI improvement by 10 points from 29. Drop down to 19. But what they found out was a severe hypertension in five of those babies. And they have to stop this study. Though the FDA doesn't approve, the American Heart Society and the Thoracic Society do recommend as an adjuvant therapy for in babies who have refractory to INO therapy. So it may be considered in resource limited setting. And I think most of our Indian units do, we need to use sildenafil and IV sildenafil is easily available. So the indication for sildenafil is as adjuvant in INO resistant PPHN to facilitate weaning from INO. So you started INO, you're coming out of INO, then you need to start with sildenafil, you can start using it. And patients where there's contraindication of using nitric oxide, in those conditions you can use nitric oxide in a sildenafil. And there's a trial and a lot of studies which have come out, um, use of sildenafil in chronic pulmonary hypertension like BPD and congenital diaphragmia. So when you start using sildenafil, the dosage, what is recommended is 0.5 to 2 milligrams per kg per dose in every six to eight hour dose. And if you're using as an infusion, it is recommended as milligrams as loading, then as an infusion around 1.6. But keep in mind that this can cause significant hypertension that shouldn't exaggerate hypertension. So be careful when you're using IV sildenafil. The next drug which I would like to discuss is milrinone. It's a PDE inhibitor, basically acts by increasing the cyclic AMP. It is both inotropic and lysotropic and inotilator. So it is very good, especially when there is ventricular dysfunction from especially the left ventricular dysfunction. And it acts very well with INO when you use it. But there are not much major studies. I could find out only two randomized clinical trials, a small, uh, two small case series trials too. Uh, the efficacy and safety of milrinone in, uh, in newborns is not extensively known. There are a lot of studies going on currently. Probably will probably hear this in the next coming couple of years about the you know, rampant use of milrinone. So currently what they recommend is whenever there is a ventricular dysfunction with PPH, which we commonly see in sepsis, asphyxia, or congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So in those conditions, probably you can use, provided you have a good systemic uh, you know, uh, SVR. If the SVR is low and the blood pressure is low, be careful using milrinone. So the loading dose is 50 mics. So one hour, and we generally infuse as 0.33 to 0 0.99 mics per kg per minute as continuous infusion. The next drug, what I would like to discuss is uh, Bacenton, which is quite rapidly used in uh, 
infants and in children. Um, it is an endothelial one receptor antagonist, and uh, there are only few studies which have been used in neonates. A single trial of 47 neonates uh, with PPHN in a setting of uh, where there was no nitric oxide or ECMO was used, and what they found was a significant improvement in the Y index and oxygen saturation. Um, so, but at the same time, when they look at the small trial of 21 infants, they were, didn't make much difference. So definitely, you can think of using this even which is used for the ductal patents is quite available but other like other medications like and Veraprost are not commonly available they are given at different uh, modes like oral intravenous or subcutaneous but had only one experience in overseas but not in India I'm sure the same thing would apply to a lot of us to practice in India now coming to the most important factor, a lot of people would uh, probably uh, need to understand the RV dysfunction is the one of the most important things. So how can we optimize the RV preload? Be very careful using, uh, you know, judicious boluses. So be cautious. Use we are come out of dopamine um, mainly because it has alpha effect and also has effect on cardiac contractility. So epinephrine is a good choice or a non-epinephrine is a good choice. To reduce the systemic, um, to reduce the RV after load reduction, one of the most potent uh, gas is nitric oxide. But in centers who don't have nitric oxide, you can, if the blood pressure is good, you can think of using milrinol. And if the ductus is closed, and you want to kind of um, open that ductus so that you have a pop, pop of valve so the RV gets under load, then you can think of using prostaglandin E1. So today what I have discussed is basically managing PPHN in level two. I have not touched in detail about nitric oxide, how much to use, when to use, and how we can wean from nitric oxide. Or use high frequency ventilator um, as the mode of ventilation. So I haven't touched about high frequency ventilation, how you set up a high frequency ventilation, which are the ventilators we use. And um, so hopefully, uh, if given an opportunity, probably the next episode, I would like to discuss with that. Um, and also the ECMO part of it, briefly, I would like to discuss. So with this, I would like to conclude with few of my you know, take home points. So in the current era, oxygen, though it's been rampantly used, it's a very good Try to keep the saturations between 92, 93 to 96, 97. Try to aim the PAO2 around uh, 60 to 70. Try to get the most important thing uh, in my management of my attention is to get an arterial line. And it is always to get the pre-ductal arterial saturations of the gas. So if the unit are good enough to place a right radial artery, it is fantastic. If not, don't worry, you can always put a UASC. Um, and you probably get the mix, at, you know, the saturations, uh, the oxygenation level, PA will be slightly low, but that will give you a guide uh, what is the change in the ductal level, the shunting. So if you're trying to give, if you ventilate, if you want to give surfactant, give as early as possible based on the lung parenchymal you know, illness. So if it is RDS, sure, you probably can think of giving surfactant. That itself would probably decrease. Using, try to use it very early. And we have seen that if you use surfactant and when uh, early, if the oxygenation index is less than 15, it does do improve the pulmonary vascular resistance. 
most of the centers when you don't have nitric oxide you can think of using sildenafil but be cautious about it causing the inner system hypotension and if you have used nitric oxide still um, you know you're, you're not able to achieve what you are and it is refractory nitric oxide try to use sildenafil uh, and when you're coming out of nitric oxide you can use it as actually Mildenone, fantastic drugs, a lot of cardiology and cardiac centers use Mildenone as one of the inotropes because it has both inotropic and lysotropic effect. But be sure that the systemic pressures are good and the LV function, if it is poor, try to use that over time. You would see the improvement in the left ventricular function. As I told you earlier, hydrocortisone, though some of the centers do use, but make sure that sepsis is being ruled out before you use hydrocortisone. So as I told you early, uh, probably we'll see whether uh, we can cover this with the next uh, next uh, episode. Uh, because of lack of time, I was told um, I have uh, 40 minutes to 45 minutes then uh, discussions across all the senior neonatologists who have joined us today. Um, I can discuss about this with the next presentation. So to end, uh, I thank you all for joining today. I know you've taken off your time on Saturday evening. Thank you. And thanks uh, to the NNF Karnataka chapter and Dr. Patricia sir for giving me this opportunity to present. Thank you. Sir, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, there are a few queries which have come up. Yeah. Urine uh, so routine, instead of routine, urine for bile as it comes in. That's the one I'm introducing. The first. Hello, sir. From the in the Hello. morning. From Hello, the casualty, oh, sir. I can, think it can might you hear me, sir? Lab only. I can so hear you. have to tell them. Along with that, they have to add PMS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understood, no? I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Any yeah. Any sir, first question. question. Roll of newborn training has been made. From the casualty in the morning. Uh, oh, yeah. and then, uh, we want to add also. Aman, mute all the thing. No? We'll just take one by one questions. Yeah, sir, can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you now. Uh, sir, role of uh, max sulfate in PPH, and that's the first question which has come. Yeah, so th th there are a few studies which have come up over the last few years, especially over the last five to six years, the role of magnesium sulfate in PPH. So, yeah, definitely, if you are run out of options, you can think of. Again, you need to be very clear and sure about the system hypertension which can cause. So mm -hmm. sure, um, when you have used all the sildenafil part of it, you have used all the modalities to the PHN, you have run out of option, you can think of using as a looking dose, it's better. No doubt about that. Okay. So the second question is, uh, yeah. according to your experience, sir, is there any difference between using different surfactants available? Commercially available different surfactant. Is there any difference? Well, if we know that uh, people have individual preference and individual experience, but uh, if you look at uh, most of the naturally occurring surfactant, either servant or furosel, either which is bovine or um, you know porcelain or uh, induced, both are quite efficacious in terms of opening the lungs. What basically tells the papers for which have used surfactant in management of PPHN, they don't mention about whether it is natural or um, you know synthetic surfactant, what they say is, is if you're using surfactant, use within the first you know 12 to 24 hours, not like more than two to three days when the prime hypertension is too high. Okay, so to the next question is use of sedation and muzzle relaxation. Yeah. In well, PPHN. Yeah, of, yeah, sedation definitely when these babies are on high frequency we probably should use and uh, most of the centers either use fentanyl as the first line or they use uh, morphine. Um, in terms of muscle relaxation that has been kind of uh, not encouraged, it doesn't mean that people don't use it. They, I, I can still uh, see some of them use when they think that the baby is not, um, you know, kind of totally operating in terms of managing. 
what happens is uh, one of course if the baby is very agitated and jumping around you don't have adequate sedation at the same time the baby is moving the pulmonary hypertension component can increase but with a good analgesic and a sedative effect like fentanyl or morphine you probably can escape using muscle relaxer and that itself can be kind of uh, uh, what happens is it decreases the vascular tone you may have to increase vascular tone by pumping in more fluids you may have to increase the ventilatory settings that we know that over time it not only in pphn a lot of patients we don't use muscle relaxant as freely as what we used to use uh, 10 or 20 years back okay so, so one more question is would your management vary if uh, you have a baby with severe hiv needing cooling and severe pphn would you transfer to a tertiary center needing nitric oxide well, if you are cooling, if the baby is not ventilated and you think you have achieved what you want to achieve in terms of saturation and the PA volumes, mm -hmm. and if you could mm -hmm. have a facility where you yourself or somebody could do an echo and say that pulmonary hypertension is very mild or moderate and not bothered, uh, and you have an access where in case if it deteriorates, I can share. That's a good choice to keep the baby there and continue cooling. But on the other hand, you have started cooling, um, the saturations are not great, you may have to ventilate, the pulmonary pressures are quite high, it's becoming as such cooling can increase the pulmonary pressures. Then you probably have to take a decision because that is the time where if you want to shift, you have to shift early um, so that we start using nitric oxide or you know other medications based on the need. Uh, the next question, uh, next question, sir. Yeah. In your conclusion slide, you had put milrinone should be used once, inhaled nitric oxide uh, prolongedly used. Yeah. But according to the uh, echo, if diastolic dysfunction is noted early, you can start milrinone. Is it correct? You are absolutely right. Uh, if I would have mentioned that, that's not right. Mildenone can be used along with nitric oxide. It's not that. But you use mildenone only if the ventricular function is not good mm -hmm. provided uh, your you know uh, systemic blood pressure the mean arterial blood pressure is quite, is not uh, below the pulmonary arterial pressure see what happens if you use any you see pilrinone is just not an it also vasodilator it's not a selective pulmonary vasodilator so it can cause systemic hypertension so if your systemic pressures becomes low and the pulmonary pressures are quite high then it can enhance more right to left shunting and deoxygenation that itself can cause more trouble so if your blood pressures are quite decent and you know that pretty sure the pulmonary pressures are you know isosystemic or less than the systemic then you have ventricular dysfunction you can think of using it sir uh, the next question is pulmonary hemorrhage while managing pphl uh, how do you handle well, we have to handle it. It's quite a tricky thing and it's quite a tough thing. Hopefully, you know, pulmonary bleed, uh, you cross your fingers and say that, okay, it probably stops over time. Um, the management still remains the same. The pulmonary bleed is one which is going to flood the whole lungs. There's going to be atelectasis. There's going to be surfactant deactivation. And along with that, the pulmonary hypertension. So you need to manage as such you know if there is coagulopathy you need to rule out why is it if there is a pda which is causing pulmonary hemorrhage you probably need to think okay i control the pulmonary bleed then what should i do for pda or if it is something related to sepsis if there is a dic probably that's a nasty condition where you probably you know is the sicker of all what we think um, you may have to think of using um, ffp vitamin k as a supportive uh, measure, appropriate antibiotics, and hold the baby having a you know, good saturations or a decent saturation, say a decent pH of more than 7.25 with a preductal saturations of 90 plus and a PAO2 of around 50, 60. I would accept and wait till the baby second stop. Uh, Sir, what is your opinion on usage of dobutamine since it causes myocardial dysfunction in PPHN? Why is it still used in low doses in PPHN as recent studies showed it causes vasoconstriction? Well, uh, if you look at dobutamine, basically it is a selective uh, cardiac um, you know, um, 
contractility and of course it if you use it on higher doses it does cause pulmonary um, in systemic vasodilatation too. um you have only two medications which can help for your myocardial dysfunction either mildrenor or dobutamin but if you use any other uh, vas active agents like dopamine or adrenaline or epinephrine it's more of peripheral uh, vasoconstriction but as you rightly said that you know um, i'm not pretty sure um, why it is not used but most of the centers do use still but probably i need to look into it more detail why uh, particularly in pphn shouldn't be used but what i have the information or whatever i have read through i have experienced through um, we generally don't use dobutamin if you want to increase the systemic vascular resistance we just use uh, adrenaline or epi non epinephrine and we use mildrenone if the blood pressure is good very rarely we use dobutamin sir uh, there is one more question on that line only should we maintain systemic bp or mean bp more than pulmonary pressure to achieve target saturation well i would probably look into see if you are measuring the pulmonary pressure the systolic pressure is uh, the mean mean pulmonary pressure if you are measuring then probably you can think of keeping the mean pulmonary pressure below the systemic pressure but if you are measuring the arterial line the mean systolic pressure is quite good and the pulmonary pressure is low i'm happy with that anything little bit of more than that should be good so what we need to do is at the same time assess on echo if it is predominantly what type of shunt it is uh, so if it is bidirectional then i'm okay with it but i don't want the shunt to be right to left which generally and causes more in a severe vasoconstriction and causing more severe pulmonary hypertension so i would be okay with it if it is iso or below iso um not more than uh, you know systemic patients uh, a comment on mildrenone we have used mildrenone very often that is yeah. from dr sanjana in our experience if bp is low it can be countered countered by adding noradrenaline to counter bp and second option is to avoid mildrenone bolus and start direct infusion uh, your opinion uh, devas sir well mildrenone bolus generally it is not recommended uh, if you are managing in pphn this is kind of a general statement if you want to start uh, mildrenone um, especially in the cardiac patient they would give a bolus and then top of the same infusion for that so uh, if you are starting mildrenone um, you can straight away start as a infusion either as 0.3 to 0.5 uh, probably to start with and then you can escalate in terms of uh, mildrenone um, using uh, use of mildrenone and causing systemic hypotension then adding uh, non epinephrine this is where it is a tricky thing so if you want to bring the systemic vascular resistance up at the same time you want to improve the myocardial function and also hope that mildrenone also helps at pulmonary vasodilatation you probably can think of using that but you can't keep on jacking up this inotropes thinking that it will improve improve uh, for the next one to two days because a lot of people they start um, let's say if you start epinephrine or non epinephrine at point uh, 02 or point 03 miles then uh, if you don't see a improvement you keep on going up to i've seen going up to 2.2 miles even point 3 point 4 that's quite a huge turn of inotropes when you use more than point 1 actually uh, most of this um, you know presses uh, if they really act they act even at point 05 miles per day so tight so feeding this inotropes is very important and if you are using it you need to be next to the bedside achieve what you want to do a uh, document with uh, the echocardiography you have the facilities and then that is okay uh, sir there is one more question uh, nitric oxide is shown to be oncogenic in recent studies so we should be moving away from nitric oxide dr kishor kumar sir has asked this question <laughs> fantastic kishor <laughs> uh, well we have only left with this if you want to save the baby uh, right now probably you have left only with nitric oxide yeah as we heard oxygen is the best uh, you know pulmonary vasodilator 20 30 years back when i and kishor were doing neonatology we never thought that oxygen one day will talk about uh, you know using as less as what it is i'm sure over time as the more papers come in um if it is teratogenic or carcinogenic probably 
probably will think of not using it or what is the dosage we should use which is less carcinogenic will click into it what we are using is 20 parts we don't know we might use only five parts or two parts mm -hmm. anyhow we know that we have endogenous nitric oxide production so we may have to use very a little bit of nitric oxide which opens up the pulmonary vascular bed Sir, uh, how often you see primary PPHN? How different is the management in this case? It is not very quite often if you look at the statistics. But we do get, um, you know, out of 10 cases, one case. Recently, we had a couple of babies over the last year where the doctors had closed uh, in utero. And when these babies were born, there was severe pulmonary hypertension. The right ventricle was as stiff as you would see in the classical tetralogy of uh, phallophysiology. And we did the standard care. <clears throat> and when we did the echo, we found that the ductus was closed. We tried to open the ductus, it didn't open. So what we started doing is try to achieve a pH of more than 7.25, except, you know, PAO2 is around 50 to 60. And we used nitric oxide for two to three days. It didn't show any difference. We stopped that. And started coming down on ventilatory settings, everything. The gases were fantastic. And there was no problem in terms of acidosis. We extubated. And this baby we followed up six months back. The right ventricle started to kind of modify itself. The pulmonary pressures have come down. But this is the baby which went home on sildenafil and has done well. So we do get cases um, once in a while. And this is where we need to ask maternal history of drug usage like SSRIs, you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which can provoke all these things. Uh, so there is one more question. How frequently we should be doing echo when babies on uh, inhaled nitric oxide or uh, HFOE? Well, you do, echo is basically a diagnosis for, uh, to start with, um, to diagnose the structural heart defect, if there's anything, and uh, to make sure the pulmonary pressures uh, what you want to look at it, so you start your therapies. But if you think that there is a problem with the myocardial contractility, probably you can think of, um, in, in our centers, we do it every day, or some, sometimes we may have to do it twice a day if the pulmonary pressures are not falling or the systemic pressures are coming down, it's just to see the myocardial contractility, we may have to do it twice a day. It all depends. If, if you, like Prashant, like you and few other neonatologists who are trained in, uh, you know, echocardiography, you can always think of doing. What is most important is uh, you shouldn't try to jump and keep on doing it because that itself can cause uh, pulmonary reactivity and increase in pulmonary yeah. resistance. So uh, try to use it, um, but uh, try to use it as less as often if you're sure about it. But the number is not that, uh, you know, you, you can use it uh, based on your clinical judgment. Uh, so there is one more interesting question. Why nitric oxide should not be used in normal preterm baby less than 34 weeks, but at the same time in preterm babies with sepsis or with a history of PPROM, inhaled nitric oxide is used? Well, this use of nitric oxide in you know borderline three terms or less than 32, 34, 35, 36 weeks has been extensively studied over the last uh, five to ten years. I can say um, there was one time where we never used nitric oxide to treat. Well, we know that uh, nitric oxide. Um, when you look at the you know the whole anatomy of how the pulmonary vascular bed is formed. At the, at the various gestation, there's not much of pulmonary vascularization which would have happened as, as early as 32, 34 weeks. And the effect of nitric oxide on those pulmonary vascular bed and how it's going to improve is unknown. Second thing is the pulmonary hypertension um, in preterm babies is entirely different. It's mainly probably because of the pulmonary, uh, the way the alveolar alveolization and and our capillarization happens and causes the BPD. In those babies, whether the use of nitric oxide is a questionable thing, though some centers try it out in acute crisis. But whether there are some reports of use of nitric oxide 
and ventilation and other supports during acute and causing uh, you know intraventricular hemorrhage so i don't have personal experience of using nitric oxide in preterm babies but i'm sure over time especially in dpds congenital diaphragmatic hernias where nitric oxide has not been quite you know useful probably we would come up with something which um, might not help or might we might give a try so i'm not sure about um, you know uh, i don't have personal experience neither i use in preterm babies but whatever uh, i said so is more of uh, theoretical knowledge of what i've read in papers so one last question for the day uh, in uh, pulmonary vein stenosis with pphn why is there left to right shunt through uh, pfo well that is what that that's the venous hypertension what is most important to my colleagues um, is the most difficult part in diagnosing uh, pphn when you have pulmonary vein stenosis so or a total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage so you need to make sure that um, when echocardiography is done and you know that the lungs are um, you know not doing what you are supposed you are expecting that saturation is improved but you know you are thinking of pphn but the structure of the heart looks good you need to ask your cardiologist or yourself when you are doing an echo whether you have seen three vessels which are draining into the left atria so the three pulmonary veins that's a compulsory you know kind of a thing which you need to look at it. so if the all the three veins are draining into the left atrium then you know that of course the pulmonary veins are draining into the left atrium if you have any suspicion of that you need to make sure that there is no pulmonary vein stenosis either proximal or distal or there is no total anomalous pulmonary vein the main problem here is the blood which is supposed to come to the left atrium is flowing back to the lungs so you're getting into plum pulmonary edema and it's more of a pulmonary venous hypertension than a pulmonary arterial hypertension so the left atrium is enlarged so when the left atrium is enlarged you see backward flow that instead of right to left you see left to right and this is where you, it's strongly indicated you don't need to use i know you know basically nitric oxide because it is a selective pulmonary vasodilator so you are going to flood the lungs more uh, sir uh, uh, one last question uh, this is the final question for the day and then we'll close the session sure. uh, i would like to know all the details of pphn from the expected antenatal uh, to birth any information regarding idiopathic causes for pphn cause causes for idiopathic pphn yeah probable Any causes uh, to, probable to, to causes for idiopathic before PPHN. before labeling it into idiopathic well you rule out all the causes of the heart mm -hmm. you rule out all like you don't have a history of meconium aspiration you don't have history of rds you don't have uh, you know um is is we of pneumonia or sepsis then the lungs look good but the pb is still hypoxemic then probably you have to think of idiopathy cause as pulmonary hypertension and usually these are the ones um you know where we don't find a cause can i ask one question yes sir yes sir please go ahead sir uh Doctor uh, Prakash. Hi, hi, Dinkar. Hi. See, you told steroids uh, is not methyl prednisolone is okay in inflammation, but yeah. there is few twelve cases studied in um, Andhra Pradesh with a severe PPHN. Twelve cases studied in yeah. uh, totally one hundred and fifty three cases. In yeah. that, they have done everything without ECMO. They have done nitric oxide. They have put on HFO. Whatever the things they have done it. But they yeah. are not improved. Only thing was ECMO per per uh, patient patient attendants were not affordable, so they yeah. started steroids. Or many babies were improved. Then they came and they were about to send for the what could be the reason. Then when they have sent the blood and the little bit of the lung biopsy, then they find out they found out it was a uh, what is it pulmonary glycogeno uh, glycogenosis pulmonary. So mm -hmm. only treatment is steroids. so they have studied in uh, what is it andhra pradesh vishak uh, vijayawada nuri children's hospital right 12 cases or 13 cases so steroid in case 
what i felt is in case everything is done before ecmo not affordable i think so we can even start but the newer thing in pphn what ramaswami ranganathan is telling even yeah. steroid can be used early also there is no problem even in mas what is your conclusion last see, i told you then first even in mas we can start what is your conclusion see that, that is what you see you let let us look at mas first it meconium aspiration syndrome you know that it is meconium so we are not sure um, you know um, how the baby we have seen extreme forms of meconium aspiration syndrome some would rest just improve by just see fat let's say if it is severely bad phn with meconium aspiration syndrome and if it improves without any of this grace we also know that meconium aspiration causes chemical pneumonitis and this extensive inflammatory thing which is happening in the lung so the corticosteroids do as anti inflammatory properties but make sure that this baby's blood cultures are negative the counts are fine the crp is fine if you are using procalcitonin levels check those levels and if they are all fine there's no harm by giving one dose or two dose i don't think so it will uh, kind of knock the baby off so sure you can use but let's say in visakhapatnam what the people have done is for 12 babies but what i would like to pass on the message is now is that you know don't use steroids straight away i kept it as a last that is the last resort if you are use if you have used everything think of using corticosteroids and if it makes a difference great but again having said that even if a child is going on ecmo they prime the babies on steroids to suppress the inflammatory mediators because it's a heart lung machine the circuit will be prime um so these babies will release lot of cytokines so they want to suppress they use steroids it's not that so you can use one or two doses of steroids and this doesn't make difference the oi index is very high and if you think that okay this child will benefit with ecmo probably you can use it and send it to other center yeah in the last they have used it for pulmonary glycogenesis later they came to know once the baby is improved yeah that's again you know kind of a thing which you can't make it out quickly it is more of using a trial and then uh, retrospectively trying to work out your diagnosis why it may be different but in a majority of a clinical setting you don't see that as the first diagnosis thank you hi prakash uh, good evening dr guru prasad from davangere yeah sir namaskar sir uh-huh. yeah very excellent uh, talk i think you have covered most of pphn which is very practicable for a state like ours your topic was very clear how to manage it in a level 2 unit thank you the gold standard is i know and ecmo but uh, yeah. still uh, we, it is uh, far from uh, clinical practice uh, only people who are working in bangalore and carpo- cosmopolitan cities can think of it but the last 30 years working with this this is a nightmare clinical management of pphn is a nightmare for the entire team uh, in any hospital i think what uh, i really appreciate you covered most of it especially emphasized on uh, the ventilation and uh, i think sildenafil is something that is uh, to be considered in uh, resource limited settings uh, with close yes. monitoring and yes. um, another important thing is uh, good sedation i think you mentioned uh, yeah. maybe fentanyl or morphine and muscle paralyzing is uh, the choice of the unit because most of these are term babies which are very vigorous and very labile i think ensuring good sedation throughout the ventilation is a very challenging task uh, anyhow it was nice hearing to you uh, prakash thank you very much sir so like a lot of people do think nitric oxide does miracle but if you look at the data of use of nitric oxide for whatever cause of pphn 40% of them don't respond which i thought i'll discuss next um, you know presentation so still 60% of the pphn management just happens with whatever has spoken i'm sure out of that 50 to 60% of the babies um, if you just do the basic thing from the start would improve because majority of the chunk of pphn is because of meconium aspiration syndrome rds ptn and infection in our country most of the drugs that were discussed in the course subsequent to your talk uh, have been explored quite early in uh, pphn's history most yes. of the drugs including steroids all that again they are coming back uh, in a selected uh, population but it it can't be extrapolated that steroids are going to be changing the clinical practice of pphn i think we have to wait for larger number of patient studies 
Yeah, it's kind of uh, it suppresses the anti-inflammatory property. It has anti-inflammatory properties. Probably, you know, it helps in a little bit of uh, child getting better. But um, as Dinkar was mentioning, you know, you need to if you're clear about the diagnosis by any means, either by molecular yeah. testing of this genetic conditions, um, you can't use it just to start with. A another thing which we uh, uh, over time as a neonatologist uh, would face is babies who are born with alveolar capillary dysplasia or malformation of the complete vascular bed or babies who are born with trisomy, Down's babies with PTSD. Their pulmonary architecture is entirely different and the management varies from unit to unit and person to person. So those are the challenging babies and diagnosis only happens by lung biopsy. No, 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 no. Yeah, uh, sir, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. So we, uh, we would like to announce as well that this uh, academic session will continue till uh, next one and a half month. We have made uh, a very good schedule with all excellent speaker. Plus weekly, we'll be having one international speaker will be speaking on uh, new little topic. So it's going to be really interesting. I request all the participants to participate in the session and people who are interested in neonatology. This is going to be all exclusive neonatal webinar sessions, what we will be planning from NNF Karnataka. So I request all the participants to encourage the postgraduates, colleagues, and other uh, uh, interested uh, neonatologists and practicing pediatricians who wants to learn more about the neonatology to join us. Sir, thank you very much. It is always a pleasure uh, listening to you. You are a fantastic speaker. Everything you have covered with utmost patience and ease. Thank you very much. Uh, we would uh, be uh, publishing this in a Facebook page by tomorrow and even in YouTube channels as well. So whatever we'll be doing session from our NNF Karnataka, it will be made available for the public so everybody can view and learn and uh, get knowledge. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank all the seniors, Ranjan sir, Guru Prasad sir, Kodreshi sir, Kishar Kumar sir. Good luck, sir. All, all Hi, Prashant. 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 Prashant, 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 we really, we really appreciate your initiation. We were thank feeling you, lost sir. because of the lockdown. I think we, it's very yeah. encouraging that these sessions are happening. Website. Fine, sir. Uh, we, we have... Sir? Sorry. The so last especially the team has been organized a wonderful uh, organization by, by Prashant and Benikar and uh, thankful for Prakash for uh, collaborate of pathophysiology of PPNH and management at the level to care. Thank you, sir. Once again. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I got the opportunity to listen to a few of my senior colleagues and teachers who are my guide throughout my career and my close friends, my colleagues. So it's fantastic, Prashant. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Tomorrow, we'll be having our echo session, echo findings of PPHN and PDA by uh, our uh, favorite Dr. Venkatesh, sir. And uh, Sidhu will be discussing on case discussion. Please join us. And, and on Monday and Tuesday, we are having Guru Prasad, sir's uh, most interesting and most uh, uh, requested uh, topic that is art of newborn examination. Kindly do join us. I'll be publishing the schedule by today evening. 